nothing like the smooth, refreshing taste of a... Oh my goodness, Pookie, I didn't see there. Okay, no, of course, I would never drink from Starbucks. We're still protesting, totally. God, I hate Starbucks. Ugh, disgusting. <laughs> What's going on, everyone? Your master, Uguay, has returned, and I am here to bless your ears with some more dropshipping sauce and marketing value because this is actually going to be a really, really important video for a lot of you if you haven't seen any dropshipping success because we are going to talk about how to create winning ads for any product that you sell because I really do have a core philosophy and belief that you can nearly make any product into a winner. The products don't make you a winner. Your marketing does because two people can sell the exact same product and one person kills it with that product and scales it to six figures a month and another person can take that same exact product and lose a hundred a thousand dollars in a month with that product and it only came down to one variable your marketing your ads your offer your website your funnel so i want to talk about how you can maximize your chance of seeing more products succeeding for you and making them into winners and how you can test differently than the typical average noob low iq dropshipper and we're gonna have a few product examples so we're gonna really see if master uguay over here can cook and we can really talk through this thought experiment of how we can market these different product examples i'm going to give to you in this video so that we give ourselves that chance of finally tasting some dropshipping success which, of course, Master Uwe has already done many, many times. So let's get into our first thought experiment. I had a student yesterday on a group call come up to me. He was testing this otter product, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. It's the breathing, sleeping, baby, dog, cat, OCD, autistic otter. And basically what it does, and it has a little light of sorts, a little thing in its chest that basically breathes and goes back down as it's turned on and it can also play music to just help babies relax to help them fall asleep faster or if you are someone who has trouble sleeping you can use this otter toy to help you sleep now he tested that product even though yes it had a lot of sales other people were selling it and being successful but when he tested it it didn't work out so when we looked at what he was doing he said ethan what went wrong which is a good question, but the reality is you can do everything right and you are still going to be successful about 10, 15% of the time in dropshipping. It's a lot like baseball. It really is. I mean, in baseball, it's what? You fail seven out of 10 times and you can be a Hall of Famer. In dropshipping, you can be successful 10%. So you can fail 90% of the time. And if you have one or two big winners, I mean, you look at most successful people in this space, they have had one or two real big winners after hundreds of failed tests. So in that case, less than 5% of products succeeding for them are really making it to that level. And yet they are at the top of the game. So I think we need to redefine our definition of what it's like to be a successful dropshipper. I don't think it's necessarily based on what's your success rate. Oh, you're at a 30% success rate, but this guy's at 5%. Therefore, the 5% person's not as good. Not necessarily the case because that 30% person who maybe, yeah, can get a product to one grand a day might struggle with getting those products past one grand a day. While that other person who might have had less winning products, one or two, was able to scale both of those products to seven figures, eight figures, crazy numbers. So therefore, they've made a lot more money for a lot less work because they just had to focus on one or two products compared to that person who has to constantly churn and burn and test new products because they don't know how to consistently scale. And that is a skill in itself. So first lesson here, don't define yourself based on your product success rate. Define yourself more on when you do have a winner, how long can you scale and keep that product consistent for you? Because using the information in this video, you are going to have the exact knowledge and blueprint for doing so. Now, getting back to that example, when he said, what did I do wrong? We really looked at his test and he tested this otter to US and Canada using TikTok. He had the ads that were based on proven concepts for other people, which I have no problem with. But when he tested it out, his ads flopped. His cost per click was about $1.50 to $2. So when we looked at that, I said to myself, are the ads really that bad? And I looked at them before they tested and I didn't think so. But when we looked at the data, it would indicate that we need to make some change. So here's going to be the first real golden nugget for a lot of you guys. When you are testing a product 
you need to have a competitive edge. This is what I base all of my program, my coaching, my course, everything off of, and that's having your unique edge because there are 5 million dropshippers in the world today. And if you realistically want to beat them and be in the top 1%, you have to think outside the box. And in order to think outside the box, you need to know how are people currently doing dropshipping? And this is the reality. This is what they are doing. When someone wants to test that otter or whatever product it is, they are going to rip the top performing ads. They are going to test it in the main countries of US, Canada, Australia, UK. In many cases, just US and Canada. They're going to test it most likely on TikTok. They are going to have a basic theme like sense or dawn, which is fine. Honestly, it's not the end of the world. And they're going to have a generic 50, 60% off offer and a very simple description. That is how they test. They want to be as lazy as possible and say, hey, it's for efficiency, when really it's just they're lazy as hell. They're going to have some chat GPT description, basic photos, and that's it. That is who you're competing against. So how do we get into the top 1% when we are testing a product? How do we get that competitive edge? There's multiple ways. The first way is through your offer. You could have the same ads, the same targeting, same everything, but if you do have a more enticing, irresistible offer, you can beat whoever is currently scaling that winning product. And myself would be a pretty great example of that. And I know the main product I talk about all the time that I've scaled because I have it on my store. I have it on this YouTube channel. You can take a look. When I scaled that waist trainer to from zero to over $60,000 in two weeks, the main thing I was able to differentiate on was my offer. The, uh, the main seller of that product was selling it for around $40. It was one waist trainer, $40, compare it price, $60. Not the greatest offer in the world. So when I went to source that product, I found out, oh, it's actually pretty cheap. It's only $5 a unit. So for two units, it was $10. I could sell a 10 unit product for $30 and still get pretty good margins on that. But I just decided, okay, I'm going to sell two for 40. It's going to be a BOGO at $40. So again, much better value and that offer because the value is now instead of paying 40 for one i'm now paying 20 for each individual unit it's a lot better of a deal so there's certain things you can do with doing discounts throwing in free gifts throwing in warranties money back guarantee there's a lot of different ways you can increase your perceived offer i would say what i like to do in the beginning is usually some sort of bogo volume discount type of deal so seeing if people are willing to buy more than one because in a lot of cases, that's going to be what it takes for you to scale nowadays because of margins and because of how competitive ad platforms are. It's very hard to succeed when you are just only able to sell one unit of your product. So I'd always try to look and tinker and understand what your current margins are so that you can play around with more complex offers that do have better perceived value than a typical 50% off offer. So that's one way. Another way that people don't really talk about as much because offers are starting to get some more steam and more traction in the dropshipping community, I would say, is your target location or platform. So you can have the same offer, you can have the same ads, but you decide to differentiate by marketing to a blue ocean audience. So you have these saturated offers and the saturated ad concepts, but you found a new audience that hasn't seen these before but it has already been proven to work in other markets. AKA, we're selling the otter. It's killing it in the US. We know it's proven there, but it's probably had some saturation because the main people scaling that product have already hit the low hanging fruit. So now we have to convince people that are a little bit harder to sell to. Or we take the same ads, take the same offer, and then market it to an all new country. So we could do France, Germany, other English speaking countries, or countries where there's a lot of English speakers, Australia, Canada. United Kingdom, because not as many dropshippers are hitting those countries. Almost every single dropship in the world is hitting the United States. So United States is going to be the most competitive market in the world. I know there's that one game where it has that, that's, it's very new on TikTok, Mavalon Creek or something where it's that game where there's bugs everywhere and a only good bug is a dead bug. And it's just chaos and there's so many people around and they're all shooting at you. It's a lot like that. The United States, if you're a dropshipper, it's a lot like that where there's so many people and there's so many products and there's so many ads. 
it's hard to survive. It is very hard. You have to be on the top of your game. I wouldn't want to discourage you from doing that, but I'm just saying in some cases, if you're selling a product that's a little more tapped, it's going to require you to try to find a new audience. Now, that's not the only way you can find a new audience by just saying, okay, I'm going to change the country in which I'm targeting. You can also change the audience by identifying, is there a new target audience or a different target audience that the original dropshipper that's scaling this product has not hit? So with that order, for instance, everyone is selling that as a product to parents to help their baby calm down and sleep better. But after doing some research, my student and I identified that a dog angle was interesting, that dogs can also sleep with this. It can be a little nice companion. And when we actually looked at his ads, that was the ad that performed the best, the one that got the most ad to carts. So he did get some ad to carts from these ads. He didn't get any purchases, unfortunately, but that was the one that ended up netting the best results. And possibly if we just went all in on that specific shot of, okay, let's try different angles, but only for that target audience of dog owners, possibly would have had a winner. But we decided to only do one out of our four ad angles hitting that audience and the other three were hitting the baby audience, which was pretty topped. And we also did it to the United States. So there's a lot of factors that probably weren't the best in doing so, but we had to test. Like you're never gonna know if something uh, if something's saturated and it doesn't work until you test. Like you can make all the hypothesis in the world. You are never going to be correct until you test it. I could tell you exactly what I think is gonna happen when you test a certain product. I will never know until you actually do so. No one can predict the future 100%, no matter how much experience you have. So that would be the main two ways, in my opinion. Is there any other ways? The other two, I would say, is your platform and your ad concept. So platform, meaning if a product is killing it on Amazon, a lot of times there are products that are exclusively really crushing on Amazon, but are not really being sold on social media, on TikTok or Facebook. So you can take those products that are very proven, have hundreds of thousands a month worth of sales, start creating your own content or start seeing if there is some content online for them, which there should be at that point. And then, yeah, try to sell them on TikTok and Facebook where they haven't been scaled yet. I know with the waist trainer, it was killing it on Facebook for the original competitor of mine, took it onto TikTok. Nobody at the time was selling that product on TikTok, literally no one. And I just took a lot of the same ad concepts, but I did put my own twig on them. I did put my own twist and it crushed it for me. I had a 10 X row as immediately right out of the gate. I put I believe I was testing with $100. I did around, yeah, $2,000 the first day. It was insane. And it was mainly just because, yeah, different platform and different ad concepts. So that's another thing. If you see a lot of people killing it on TikTok, okay, we got to zig when people zag. Let's try to sell that on Facebook. Okay, we see people starting to maybe scale this product using a different form of social media. I mean, those are the main ones. And I wouldn't really know where else you would find products. Possibly Pinterest. Possibly if you're on Snapchat. God forbid if you're still on Snapchat and you're not, I mean, if you're in high school, you know, you get a pass, but if you're, if you're older than 18 and you're still on Snapchat, then what the hell are you doing with your life? Time to grow up, buddy. All right. So those would be the main things. Now let's talk about why do most ads fail? Cause that's the million dollar question it really is. How do we give ourselves the best chance to test a product and make it into a winner? So both of those questions I would say are pretty tied together. And it's, you can't single, just call out and point out to one specific thing as to why ads fail, because there is a lot of different factors. It could be maybe not even about the ad. It could be just a low quality audience. It could be the wrong target audience. It could be the wrong location. It could be the wrong platform. As we just discussed, there's a lot of other factors outside of just the ad as to why ads fail. So you can set yourself up for failure. Yeah. If you market to the wrong people, the wrong audience wrong platform. It's a lot of different things, bro. But when it comes to ad specific, let's say you have done all that other stuff, right? I would say probably the number one reason why I see people fail ad wise would be uh, wrong messaging. They just have not found the messaging that resonates with their audience the most. And when you look at brands that have really scaled, usually they have figured out the one tagline, the one phrase that they can say over and over and over again. And it just clicks in the mind of their customer. It's just, it makes it memorable. And it's why they decide to choose their product or their company over another. And I think a great example of this would be understanding, let's say we're selling something that is very generic and that almost everyone else is selling. And there's very discernible differences very minute differences between what you offer and another. 
So in that case, how do you market a product like that where you are so similar to everyone else? And I think a great example would be probably insurance companies. Because you look at a lot of insurance companies, they're all marketing, they're all running more traditional style ads, obviously on TV, but they all basically offer very similar services and offers. It's almost personal preference at that point. So how does Geico get people to sign up versus another top insurance company? Well, a lot of times it just comes from their marketing. And in their marketing, I know their big tagline is focusing on their offer. It's, you know, save 15% or more in 15 minutes or less. They have summarized what they do in such a concise, really, really punchy headline. And that is a lot of times what gets people into the door. And then when you look at all these other insurance companies, they don't say, oh, we have this specific thing we do. It's like one specific line messaging, headline, benefit, hook that gets people into the door almost every single time. And that's what you have to find. But it's hard to do that when you're not the best at copywriting and messaging. Like if you have very generic benefits and very, yeah, generic hooks, it's hard to stick in the mind of your customer when you're selling something that a lot of other people are selling. You have to think outside the box with how you present the selling points, the USPs, the benefits, the transformations, the use cases of your product. Because if you're trying to just copy everyone else and think that it's magically going to work better for you, rarely does. And I know for me, uh, bringing back the waist trainer example, I had a really, really good offer and headline. And I do believe that in, it definitely, for a fact, helped increase my conversion rate. And it was lose two pant sizes or more within 30 days or your money back. That is a really, really enticing offer. And that's what we led with. We had a specific result within a time frame. Now you have to be careful with that because with Facebook, a lot of times they don't like specific results within time frames. So I have that on my website. I believe on the ads, we would have something like just lose two pant sizes. I'll see if I can pull up those ads. And I'll link them down below. But we led, yeah, with a really, really good offer. And that's why people chose My Waist Trainer over others. It wasn't that the product was really significantly different. It was just the offer and the claim was much different. And it was much more punchy. It was much more effective. And it stuck in the minds of my customers. Now, I did have other benefits in my product that I was able to articulate in a way that got people interested as well, saying that it was completely invisible, perfect for wearing out, all those little things. But you just don't want to be someone, especially when you understand that the number one reason why ads fail is just bad messaging or the wrong messaging or boring messaging. You don't want to be the guy that does the same copy and pasted copywriting, which is, hey, our product is ergonomically designed and it's so versatile and it's uh, all, all those just generic buzzwords or it's the last back scratcher you're ever going to need. Or the, the most perfect back scratcher now exists. It's just, if you can plug in any product into the line that you're using for your copy, then you have a generic vanilla line that's going to speak to no one. The best product ever, the perfect product, ergonomically designed, versatile. All these super generic lines is usually what most beginner dropshippers use. And that's why their marketing and their messaging speaks to no one. And no one ends up clicking on their ad because they don't have the right messaging yet. Now, another reason why your ads can fail is you have the wrong concept. And it's tough. Concepts are a really interesting ball game. Because yes, I have worked with brands where they have identified the right messaging. And then we have to figure out, okay, what other formats can we try out where that messaging can also work and thrive and potentially even beat out our current winning creatives. And when you will test that winning messaging using different formats, it could be an image ad, it could be a how-to ad, a problem solution ad, all these different other formats you will notice that some formats do perform better and worse with the same messaging. So yes, the messaging, while it is super important, I would argue it is the number one thing, your format also does play a huge part. You can have the perfect messaging, but if you have the wrong way of presenting the information in a format that's not that engaging or doesn't have a good hook or just doesn't speak to people as much, your ad will fail. So that's where I do recommend when you test, you should try out four completely unique different ad angles, concepts, formats, whatever you want to call it. So let's say for instance, I am selling, we're just gonna go with the galaxy projector because that's the first thing on my mind and that's the most generic product of all time. So galaxy projector, 
that is a product that basically sells itself. So with products like that, we'd really want to highlight the visual elements of it. We'd want to figure out formats where we can show those more visual elements, but I can guarantee there's definitely certain formats that people tried for that product that just were not going to do so. Off the top of my head, maybe it's a green screen ad where someone is just reacting to themselves looking at that projector and it just doesn't have the same effect or the same feels. Maybe it's an unboxing video. I would imagine an unboxing video for that Galaxy projector. It could work, but I could see in a lot of cases just going straight to the point with your hook of showing the visuals will probably be the better way of selling that product. And in some cases, I know with that Galaxy projector in... I mean, as instance, for example, the best ad I always saw was actually more of a comparison ad. It was a us versus them ad, but most us versus them ads are an image graphic where on the left it's us and then on the right it's them. And then you just have different bullet points of why ours is better, which can work. But for that specific product, I remember the ad that really worked was get rid of your LED strips, get rid of these plastic cheap LED strips that you find everywhere. And then boom, get this Galaxy projector. It gets you the same results. It looks a whole lot cleaner and your room doesn't end up being a complete mess. So that was the major reason that they got people to buy because that is a pretty big part of selling to people is understanding what are the alternatives and why is your product better than the alternatives? Otherwise, I'm just going to buy whatever else is out there. I'm just going to buy the cheapest thing because people are just looking for what gets me results in the fastest, easiest, and for the most affordable price. In most cases, that is what is going to be the case. So you have to convince people why you have the best solution. You don't want to just be like the insurance people and just say, okay, I'm just going to figure out a new way of messaging, but not try to make my thing stand out. Because a lot of times, yeah, finding that right messaging is what's going to make you stand out. But you also have to keep in mind, there's going to be other alternatives that aren't exactly your same product. So in the insurance example, the other alternatives are other insurance companies. If you're selling cars, the other alternatives, yes, are other car brands. But that's where I get to my next point called your stage of awareness. So one of the greatest ad marketers of all time, Eugene Schwartz, who was one of these ad agency Mad Men S tycoons. He's written multiple books about copywriting and direct response ads. But basically, he coined the five stages of awareness that your target audience will have. So there will be some people that are just completely unaware. They don't even realize they have a problem. They don't even realize they have a product. They don't even realize there's solutions out there. There are people that are problem aware. There are people that are solution aware. And then there are people that are most aware. And there's one more stage I'm forgetting, but it's probably because it's not that important. So if you are buying cars, you are the most aware. You are very aware of all the different brands, all the different cars out there because you're exposed to them every single day and you see tons of ads for them. But there will be certain products that you will sell where the market awareness is almost completely unaware, aka the shower filter shower head, where what it did was you had to make people aware of the problem. The problem is your current filter, your current shower does not filter out all these dangerous germs, particles, bacteria, all this crap that can go onto your skin just through your daily showers. Most people didn't even realize that was a problem. They didn't even realize their shower was dirty. So of course they weren't going to buy a product like this because they weren't aware why they even needed it. They weren't even aware they had a problem. And you first step to convince someone to buy your product, if it's a problem solving product, is convince them that, hey, you have this problem. Here's why the problem is bad. Because it's not enough just to say, hey, you have a problem. You need to tell them why it's bad. So in that case, they said, well, your current shower is full of these pollutants, germs, bacteria, and that's causing these problems, aka bad skin, bad hair, all of these. It was mainly based on that. And that's what got people interested. So you get them aware and then you transition into, okay, here's what you need. Now that you know your current shower head sucks, you need a shower head that does this. Introducing the blank, which does exactly that. And also has these other features and benefits that will improve your life and quality of life. Now you'll have certain products where people are, and, and I would say the most common stage of awareness you are going to encounter is going to be problem aware. People who know they have a problem, they're vaguely aware of the different solutions out there, but you need to convince them why you have the best solution. Birdman hands. We're plotting. We're scheming out here. All right. Before we get into this, I just need you to promise and like and comment on this video and say that you are currently not gooning and edge maxing and looks maxing at the moment. 
I was at the bar the other week and I had this girl hit on me. She just went up to me and was just complaining. She's like, oh my God, my friend over there is being mistreated by the bartender. Can you do something? And I just turned around and I was like, you already know that bagged her immediately. Next thing you know, we're back in my place. All right. Getting back into it. God, I kind of lost my train of thought there. I was a little, yeah. When you go down memory lane like that, especially good memories. All right. So getting back into, yeah, stages of awareness. So most products, you have to tell people why you have the best solution. So how do you do that? Well, us versus them is a great place to start. Your product page is another great way to start as well because you can have those compare us charts. So you can have yeah, us versus them, us versus others have a direct comparison in your copywriting on your product page. That was a big thing for me as a waist trainer brand. People knew they were fat. People knew they wanted to lose weight. They knew the general solutions out there. And I had to convince them why waist trainer was the best one because it's easy. It's fast. You get instant results. It actually does have long-term effects. If you wear it for hours and hours and hours, it's very convenient. You don't have to work out. You don't have to diet. So that's what I had to do. I had to convince people that dieting, and working out was not right for them if they wanted to lose weight. The waist trainer is. That is a tough sell. I can't lie. But then again, it was an easy sell because people are always looking for the easiest way to do something that has the less friction. And going out and working out is tough. It's hard. They've tried it. It doesn't work for them. They've tried dieting. They tried doing all these fancy diets and these Oprah Winfrey. What was that uh, big company back in the day? Weight Watchers. They tried Weight Watchers. They tried all those different things. It didn't work for them. So I told them the reason why those things don't work is because of X, Y, and Z. And that's why you need something that's more convenient that you can do every single day without even noticing that will still get you the results that you want. So you can become more confident and feel more beautiful in your own skin. And that's why you need this waist trainer. And it worked. People were able to come to their own conclusion based on my copywriting, based on my ads. And even in my ads, I didn't even mention the other products, but when they got to my product page, I did mention those other solutions and why they suck. In a lot of cases, you have to do that. If people are not problem aware, okay, focus on that problem and really convincing people why that problem is a big deal. Stab that knife, twist it. Don't just say, here's the problem, twist it. People do not care if you just say, okay, you have a problem. You have to make them want to take action on solving that problem. The only way you can do that is by identifying it, then twisting the knife. And I know another great example I had was there was a student of mine who was selling this phone for your kids. It's a plastic, it's not even a plastic phone. It was a very generic phone where all it could do is just call. I can't text. It was like a Blackberry back in the ancient times. And how he was marketing it originally was, hey, isn't this a cute thing that your son, little daughter in elementary school can have? They can call their grandparents. That was his main angle. Have your kids call their grandparents and keep in touch with them. Do you have that problem where your grandparents are annoying the hell out of you in their retirement homes and they won't just shut up and die already? Well, have your kids call them so that they don't bother you as much. That was essentially his, his main idea, his main selling point, his main use case. And when I looked at that, he was selling the product for 25. It cost him $5. I was like, bro, you could charge 5x for the exact same product and all you have to do is just change that unique selling point. Change the value proposition to something that is a much bigger problem. Because that is another thing that will add a ton to the perceived value of your offer without you changing prices and having to offer free gifts and all this. Understand what is the most valuable result or transformation someone can get from this product. What is the most valuable thing that they would pay thousands for they, they can tie back to your $25, $50, $100 product. So in that instance, we actually did raise the price to $100 because there was other competitors selling similar products. But the way they were able to justify that is just by changing the use case. So for us, we said, keep your children safe so that they can always call you and tell you where they are. So you always have that peace of mind of knowing that your kid is safe because of this phone. If you don't have this phone, God forbid. And this is actually how we led the product page. We said every year... 800,000 children are abducted in the United States or in wherever we are marketing. That means every single day, 100 plus, you know, whatever the number is, in that case, it would be, what, thousands, um, are abducted every single day. 
So we identify the problem. Then the next, we have to twist the knife. And security commercials do a really good job of this, where security commercials will say, you know, every minute a house is broken into. And then people will say, oh, okay, yeah, I get it, but it's not going to happen to me. That happens to other people, but it won't happen to me. So then the next thing you have to do is relate it to them and say that, yes, this can happen. So we twisted the knife more. We told them how likely it is for their kids to be abducted, how likely and just how the rise of crimes against kids were like consistently rising every single year. So don't be the one that ever worries, did I do enough? Don't be the one that ever says, did I do everything I can to protect my child? Be the one that's prepared for everything because a responsible, safe parent who wants the best for their kids will buy this phone. We'll keep them safe. We'll have that peace of mind. Do not leave these things to chance because although we want to pretend that bad things never happen to us, everything can change in an instant. Everything can change in an afternoon. Your entire life, the years you have put into your kid can all go away in one afternoon. And that got a lot of people to fucking buy, bro. That was pretty good. That was saucy. Ethan Dobbins was cooking up in here. But that's how we were able to charge 5X. It had nothing to do with anything else. It was just changing the use case, changing the messaging to something that was more powerful and potent. And you're not going to get chat GBT to come up with that stuff. That just requires you to do your own research. We just understood our market at a very deep level. Now, I know I've been ranting and I'm going, to, I'm going on for around 30 minutes here. And I'm honestly only halfway done with my notes. I know I'm the mayor of Yapperville over here. And I do need to get this video out because it is currently currently 11.08. I need to get this video out by 12. Talk about last minute procrastination. I am back in high school. <laughs> my project's due at midnight. I got to get this done. All right. Let me look at my notes, see if there's anything else I really want to cover. Um, so how do you get good? So... Let's just first take a little step back on why did most ads fail? Not the right concept, not the right messaging. Also things that will matter is if you have a poor hook, meaning your visuals are not that enticing. It's usually tied to your visual more than actual hook text. If you have a boring visual, a lot of people are not going to want to watch the rest of the ad. Now your hook text can make a difference because you have to sell people on why they need to watch the rest of your video. You have to create some intrigue, some curiosity, open a loop. So how do you do that? In a lot of cases, you're going to mention either a dream result for them, you're going to mention their current state, you're going to mention a time frame, a pain point, or a pain point subtraction. You're probably saying, okay, Ethan, what the hell does any of that mean? Can you give me some examples? Yes. Okay. So let's talk about that. Viewer, uh, viewer before state to dream state. Those are the main, re uh, main ways that people are able to get people's attention with their hook. If you're a single guy that wants to pull 10 out of 10s every time you walk out of the house, you need to watch this video. If you are a single guy that wants to get your dream girl, then you need this. You need this hack. You need this product. And then that opens the loop because they're like, okay, that speaks to me. I am that person. I do want that result. So you have to get into the head of your target audience and know what messaging in your hook will get their attention. What do they really crave and desire? Because if you could say, hey, if you're a single guy and you just want to be able to talk to girls, you need this product. But that might not appeal to them. Maybe they don't want to talk to girls. Maybe they just want girls to come to them. So again, it's little nuances and little tweaks that can get people interested or little nuances and things that won't get them interested. You have to find though the right messaging, the exact right combination of words that will get them peaked in their interest. So those would be the viewer before states your dream states. And you can apply this to a lot of different products. Let's say I have a spin scrubber. That was a very popular product. So just you can clean your house more effectively without having the back aches and all that. So if you are currently breaking your back every time you have to clean your house, or if you dread cleaning your house every morning or every week, then you need this product. That's immediately going to speak to anyone who has to do the daily chore or the weekly chore of cleaning their house. Because yeah, I do hate having to clean all the time. I do hate having to break my back. I do have hate having to reach into those nicks and crannies. Okay, let me find out what is the solution? What can I do differently? That's how you peak curiosity and interest. But if you just go straight into the hook of saying, and I would say what most dropshippers do if they have the spin scrubber, they're just going to just show the product immediately. And they're just basically going to ruin the surprise. Like if you give people the ending of your video immediately, like why would I bother watching the rest of the ad? It's like watching a movie. If they give me the ending immediately, if I get it spoiled to me, it makes me way less likely to want to honestly watch the rest of it or even start watching it. So a lot of times you just have to, with your hook, 
have a really interesting visual and it could be the product. It could be the product in action. If that's the most interesting visual you can find, sure, go for it. But you just really need to think what is that visual that's going to make them to stop scrolling. Other things, time frame pain points. Okay, so time frame. We already talked about this with a waist trainer lose two pant sizes or more within 30 days. Is there a specific time frame that you can tie back to your product? Make your room into a galactic paradise in minutes. That's another time frame. In minutes, in seconds, in days, in weeks, month, whatever it is. Just calling out a specific time frame because when you have that specificity, it does get people's attention. They love specificity. People love numbers because for some reason it makes things more tangible and more real to them and more authentic compared to a normal claim. Other things, pain point. So just calling out whatever their pain point is. If your child is constantly screaming and being a pain in the ass. So if, you're const if your child is constantly screaming at night and driving you crazy, then you need to try this out. I think a lot of parents would be interested in finding out what that thing is. Then you got the otter baby or the otter toy. All right, other things. Uh, main problem with hooks. So in my notes, I have this here. The problem with most hooks is they lack specificity. They are very generic and do not open a curiosity loop or the benefit promise and payoff is not that interesting. So maybe you even have a hook that's structured the right way. But yes, as we mentioned earlier, that payoff of watching the videos just is not enticing. So again, it could be, as we mentioned, if you're a single guy that wants to talk to girls, maybe that payoff just again, not that interesting. I'm just like, eh, that's kind of generic, whatever. I'm going to keep scrolling. So make sure you really have a claim that's going to get people's Johnson's going, you know, they're super soakers spraying. You got to have something that's juicy enough for them to trade their time in because their time is valuable. People do not want to watch videos, especially ads. So you really have to have a hook that Trojan horses things a little bit. You just can't go straight to the point with a lot of ads. Um, other things I had, honestly, we are, we're pretty much done. Um, I'm going to see if there's anything else I really, really wanted to mention. Okay, two other points. Two other points before we wrap this up. My chug jug. Ah, oh, good. My health, my armor was low. Okay, so how do you get good at marketing? Honestly, I should probably have a dedicated video to this because I know it's so long to the point where honestly like 10% of you are even at this far. Congratulations if you got this far, by the way. Comment. Looks maxing. We're doing looks maxing today. That's how I know. That's how I know you're a true soldier. Okay. So the way you get good at marketing is usually just pattern recognition. Meaning if you are someone who's completely new versus someone who's been in the game for five years, really the main difference is that you've spotted a lot of winners in the past based on your frame of reference, based on seeing what has worked for other people and based on what you've done that you know works for you. The only difference between a marketer with five years of experience and a marketer that is completely new is that marketer with five years of experience just knows more about the tricks of the trade. They know oh, I'm selling this product. I've seen, okay, this product or similar product work in the past. And this was the concepts they tried out. This was the messaging they tried out. So they just have that frame of reference compared to when you're new, you're going to have to find that out on your own. So I really do believe with almost every skill in dropshipping, it just does come down to that. It is pattern recognition. It is. And the only way you get pattern recognition is you test your own frameworks over time. You test multiple frameworks. You keep testing new things. You keep testing new products and different niches so that you can expand your marketing brain and just keep on playing till you eventually have a playbook, have a framework that has succeeded for a product. And then you just replicate that for other products. So that's really the main difference at that point. You've understanded the basic level of marketing that is understanding your target customer, understanding what really matters to them, the benefits, the transformations, the use cases, the problems, all those different things, you know how to get into the mind of your customer. And then you just know, okay, based on all this information, based on the clips I have available to me, I know these frameworks that I've tried and worked in the past will probably work for this product. That is really what it's about at the end of the day. That is how you get good at marketing. And it, it does come from experience. It does come from trial and error. You have to try out these different frameworks because I may say, hey, problem solution is my best framework. But when you try problem solution, for some reason, the way you execute it, it just doesn't work for you. But when you try how to ads, those end up being your superpower, your hero. And the best ad for me is actually doing a social proof mashup ad. It's getting four or five clips of different influencers talking about my product, mashing it all into one ad. That tends to be my best performers with most products. I really like that product. I will almost always test concepts, that exact concept for nearly every single problem solving product I ever use. 
Now, other ways you can develop pattern recognition is obviously studying the best brands right now. So I use an app called Foreplay, terrible name, but great software. And it allows you to go and look at what other big brands are doing. What are they testing? And you will notice the nuances. You will notice the patterns. You will notice that a lot of big brands have found the right messaging, the messaging that works for them, the specific headline, the specific benefits and comparisons. And all they will do is just use the same messaging, but in different formats or vice versa. They have found a specific format that works every single time. And then they will try new messaging with that format. So they found out, and there's a great example. There was this hair brand that I was studying the other day that basically has a curling hair one. I'm sure you guys have seen a million of those. And the format that was working really well for them was doing three reason why ads. So three reason why ads were always working. So then all they did was just, they changed those three reasons. They changed the messaging up and they would also and a way you can try to change things up once you have a format that works is just trying different creators. So you got the exact same script, exact same messaging, exact same format, but just having a different creator in there is going to result in an all new ad performance because one creator may say the lines better. One creator may have better visuals. There's so, uh, so many different variables at play there. So that can be a way that you keep things alive once you've identified the right messaging and concepts because you don't want to have to constantly keep having to find new ways of saying the same things and new concepts. But once you find something that works, double down on it and just get new creators, get new fa uh, get new faces. I'm sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice, but that would be one of the main things you'll notice. They either have identified the right messaging and they're just testing different formats or they found the right format and they're testing different messaging. But that is what the big brands do. And you will save these ads. You will notice, okay, here's new frameworks that I didn't even know existed. So let me save those in their own specific folder. Let me save these success style ads. Let me save these bullet point benefit graphic style ads. Let me save these green screen ads, these POV ads. There's so many different ad styles and you will notice what works and you will start to see what good ads look like because you have to build that pattern recognition of this is what a good ad looks like. This is what a successful ad looks like. Here's what they're doing. Here's the nuances. They're always doing this with their hook. They're always having a very interesting visual as the hook. When it comes to the body part of their ad, the middle, they're always doing this. They're always being really specific with those benefits and having multiple cuts of that specific benefit on screen. Oh, their call to actions. They're always doing this with their call to actions. You just want to do pattern recognition of seeing, okay, here is what the top brands in most cases are doing. Pattern recognition, boys. That's going to teach you way more than any book will that about marketing strategies and concepts and fundamentals. You have to know what currently works today. You have to know what's the meta because it's always evolving. It's always changing. Last year, UGC content was all of the rave. It was the cat's pajamas. It was like sliced toast. It was all peaches and cream back then. But nowadays, UGC is definitely going back a little bit. It's not nearly as popular. Does it still work? Of course it does. Everything works. But I would say more ad style ads are working nowadays more direct response style ads are definitely coming back and working so ads that do yes call out problems that do get right into here's demos of my product product demo ads seem to be what's working the best right now at least among my ad accounts so you got to notice the nuances you got to see okay this month or this year what's working what's working for the majority of people and let's try to test those concepts for myself and for my product test so a lot of things there. So we talked about market awareness. We did talk a little bit about customer research. I'm going to get into customer research just a little bit. Then we'll get to my final point. And then you can take all these learnings and all these notes. So customer research, how do you actually understand what your customer is thinking and what they care about? And this is something you can never skip. If you skip this step and you just think ChatGPT is going to do this for you, then you are a... You are... I'm trying to think of an insult that would be like tech talk slang. You're a certified L. I'm just going to go with that. You're not a munch. You are not a gooner. <laughs> I don't know, dude. Um, it's, it's too early in the morning. So customer research is basically just doing the research of reading reviews and understanding why is your customer buying your type of product or why are they interested in your type of product in the beginning? And the best way to talk to your customers without having any customers is seeing what reviews are already out there online for similar products or the exact same product that you sell. So for instance, if I am selling a water bottle, I will look at similar water bottles and I'll see what made people buy. Cause they will tell you, they'll say, Oh, it was this specific design or it was this specific feature that I really wanted, or it was this specific, 
whatever it is that made me buy. And then that's what you're going to call out. Or they could say, oh, I had all these other water bottles, but they always had this specific problem. They would always leak. They would always cause messes. They would always have blank. And then of course, awesome. We're going to use that in our ads. All you have to do though, is you have to read hundreds of reviews. You cannot skip this part. Now you can add 20 or 30 of the best reviews into ChatGPT and have them also brainstorm and tell you, hey, what are the common words, phrases, trends, problems, benefits, use cases that we're seeing over and over again? Because that's what you want to get, pattern recognition there. You read hundreds of reviews from Amazon, from right now one of the best places for me is Reddit, Amazon, Reddit, your competitors, which in a lot of cases they're going to fake reviews. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt there. YouTube reviews of your type of product, TikTok reviews, TikTok comments as well. And then you're going to gather all this information. You're going to gather all these comments. You're going to skim through them. And see, what am I seeing over and over and over again? Because those are the main things we want to hit. Because you'll get some reviews that are random and say, oh, I bought this for my dog. And it's like, okay, that was the only person out of hundreds. So probably shouldn't mention the dog thing, even though it is mentioned. What are the common things you see over and over and over again? And then you just repeat the same things or you handle those objections before they even happen. You need to proactively handle objections with your product page and with your ads if you want to get people to buy. If you don't proactively handle these things, then they're going to happen. You're not going to have another chance to talk to them. I mean, you, you can't talk to your customers when they're on your website and they're just going to leave. They're not going to buy. So the only way you can get into their head and really get people to buy is by understanding them at a deep level and just reading reviews. Final thing, we're going to wrap this up. <laughs> I know it was a long one. Hopefully you guys enjoy these videos. I've noticed you guys tend to. Some ads should feel like ads. Some should not feel like ads. Some ads should tell a story. Others should be right to the point. The overall thing you need to do though, and I'm just going to read from my notes here because I did it in a pretty articulate, eloquent way, is you need to test to see what resonates the most with your target audience. In a lot of cases, the most common scenario I see with most products, at least for me, is when you don't sell to your audience, you just show them what your product can do and let them come to their own conclusions as to how that can fit into their life, that tends to be what works the best. I think the biggest trend I'm noticing this year is ads that don't sell, but just show. Product demo ads. Show the use cases. Show what it can do. And then let people naturally think in their, think to themselves. People have good imaginations. Oh, if I had this product, I could do that. Oh, I could do that with my uncle Jimbo. Oh, I could do that. Oh, that would be really useful for when I'm doing that. Without telling them, let them come to their own conclusions. It's a lot like when you're writing papers in middle school. You don't show, you tell. You describe it. You don't say they were in love. You show they were in love through their actions, through specific nuances, through those feelings, those butterfly emotions. You let people come to the conclusion because people don't want to be sold to. People don't want you to tell them why they need to have this product. You make them come to their own conclusion. I'm finding that that reverse psychology, and it's a lot like dating as well. And you know what's interesting? Probably actually a better example. I used to play Clash of Clans all the time in middle school. I still play today. Not as much. But in Clash of Clans, there used to be this thing called the world chat where basically you could talk to people all around the world. And what most people were doing is they were trying to recruit people to their clan. It was very important to get a lot of clan members. And I started my own clan. And I remember how tough it was to get new members to join because no one wants to join a clan with one person. They just want to join a winning team, a winning clan that had 20, 30, 40 different members. And they were stacked to the gills. So everyone was just focusing on recruiting and everyone's message was the exact same. If you went into the world chat, everyone was like, hey, join my clan, join my clan. If someone would just write a message, they would say, hey, how's it going, everyone? 10 people would spam, hey, what's going on, X, Y, Z? I don't want to make any porn references, but there was a lot of porn names. <laughs> hey, Lana Rhodes 69 x 31 join my clan. Everyone would just harass them like they were a hot girl at a club. And I remember... The way I was able to recruit people to my clan, even though I wasn't like top ranked or anything, I had a town hall level eight, is I would just say, hey, what's going on, man? I would just have a conversation with them. I would never tell them to join my clan. I specifically actually told people, do not join my clan. I'm the only person in it. I love that that's the way it is. And I would just literally do the opposite. I did reverse psychology. I did, 
I am not desperate. I do not want you. I am just here to chat. And I was funny. Like I would make my jokes in there. Everyone else was just straight to the point. They were join my clan, join my clan, join my clan. They were so desperate. They were so needy. They were begging. I was the complete opposite. And I was able to recruit a full 30 member clan in a day or two. Just because my messaging, just because I didn't tell people to do something. I'm just like, hey, we have this clan. We're starting to grow it. It's pretty cool. I wasn't desperate. I didn't tell them what to do. I showed them, hey, just through my own vibe and through my energy that it's fun, that we have a good clan. We have a good environment because if I'm cool, most likely everyone else is. So hopefully there's a lesson in there for you that you have to try different things because yes, it depends on the product. Certain approaches are going to work better. I don't want you to just discredit and say, okay, I can't make ads that feel like ads because a lot of times those still do work and you have to test different formats. I think the overall message of this video is if you want to make any product a winner, it involves lots of split testing on your messaging, on your format, on your hooks, all those different things. But just don't think that you can get away with doing the bare minimum, which is copying the best performing ads, running them to the same audiences, the same locations, and thinking you're magically going to print money. Especially if you are going to market to the most saturated countries and saturated locations and saturated audiences, then you best believe you need to test with different ad concepts and different messaging so that you can stand out and obviously appeal to the audiences that were not being appealed to and that were not resonating with the original winning ads because there will still always be people even with the best performing ads that do not interact and do not like them. So there is an opportunity for someone to come in and find those people, find that target audience that was not being appealed to by just changing up the messaging. So find your competitive edge. Think of ways to think outside the box, zig when people zag, I can guarantee your success will be much higher. Hopefully you learned a thing or two in this video. I know it was a lot. Just as a quick bonus for you guys, in terms of my three best performing ads, I did write this down. Social proof mashup ad, how to and before and after are my best three. If you're wondering how to do those, social proof mashup ad is just a hook of a dramatic reaction usually that someone has to your product of using it. Like, oh my God, no way. And then you just get into, here are three, five clips of people talking about the product, why they love it. And then a call to action. How to ad. Hook is going to be teaching someone how to get a result, how to get a desired result. As we talked about earlier, before, current situation, dream, desired destination. And then after your hook, aka how to get a six pack for summer, then you just get into, all right, here's our product. Here's how it works. Here's how it's going to get you that result. Um, before and after, split screen, before and after. Here's life before using the product. Here's life after using the product. So it could be someone who's unhappy on the left or someone who has lots of uh, pimples and acne, and then someone on the right who has clear skin. It's the same person, obviously. Um, and then after your hook, you either mention the main problem that they had before using the product, or you just introduce the product. So it's up to you what you want to do after the hook. Then you do your unique selling points, usually some testimonial or social proof, then a call to action. So yes, I, once you figure out formats that work, you also need to break down what are the different clips that usually make up that format. And that's why it's a different format. So you don't just write these things down. So you have to actually break them down as well. When you're studying the best ads, when you're using foreplay, when you're studying Facebook ad library, all those top things, don't just say, okay, I see this ad style working, actually break it down so that you know how to execute it yourself. I do have some other thoughts, but this video is definitely getting long. So if you want a part two on how to become a better marketer, I definitely have more notes and more thoughts that I would share and that I really only share with my elite coaching students because we really get into the weeds when it comes to ads because that is the biggest skill you have to learn. You have to learn how to market. You have to learn how to come up with irresistible offers. You have to learn how to come and understand your target audience. Don't, not how to come. Don't, don't clip that. Don't clip that. I swear. Okay, I'm going to go. Bye.